In this video, I'll cover these videos, which come from the second context point of the Maintaining a Balance module, and it will be video MB 2.1 to MB 2.12. What I'll do, I'll talk about the verbs and connect those verbs to contents, basically letting you know what you need to know for each of those dot points. And if you want to skip to any of those areas, you can just follow the links here, and they'll jump to different parts. So I've usually bundled different dot points together. The first one of these I'm going to cover is this one, which says using light microscope and prepare slides to gather information to estimate the size of red and white blood cells and draw a label diagram of each. You need to know the procedure as well of the experiment you went through, but here I'll just cover these estimate and draw a label diagram part. So estimate the size, you need to know that red blood cells are 7 micrometers to 8 micrometers and white blood cells are roughly 12 micrometers in size. And you also need to be able to draw a label diagram, so you need to be able to draw a scale and also need to know that the white, actual white blood cell has a nucleus, whereas red blood cell has no nucleus. Next one was identify, which means name recognize, a product extracted from DNA blood, and also needs to be able to do discuss. In this case, identify the issues, what that means, identify the issue of use of these products, and provide arguments for or against its use. So identify why they're being used and provide arguments for or against its use. So for example, one of the actual things that's um, extracted from DNA blood is fresh frozen plasma. And what it's been used for is it's been used for patients with coagulation problems. And the reason why it's being used for those people is because plasma contains clotting factors. So that means that people who have coagulation problems could clot their blood pr properly as it should. Right? That's why it makes sense to give them fresh frozen plasma. Now, white blood cells. White blood cells are used for chemotherapy patients. And the reason why is because chemotherapy patients have a weaker immune system because they've lost white blood cells. So giving them more white blood cells makes sense to make sure they have a normal, properly working immune system. Immunoglobins, that's used for people who have rare infectious diseases. And what they, these immunoglobins are, are specialized proteins. And these specialized proteins help fight infection. So it makes sense to give people who have these rare infectious diseases, special immunoglobins. And we also have red blood cells, again, another component. These are given to people who have anemia. And the reason why is because anemia is a condition where people have low red blood cells. So it kind of makes sense to give them red blood cells to increase the level of red blood cells and make them have normal amounts of energy, which is what they need for a normal function. And platelets, this is given to people who have platelet deficiency disease. The reason why is because platelets stop them bleeding. So if they don't have enough platelets because of the deficiency diseases or conditions, that means they won't stop bleeding properly. So by giving them extra platelets, their body will work normally again. Right? So next one I'll cover is this one, which means report. So find out and talk about the progress in the production of artificial blood. So at the moment, this is what we currently have. We've got saline solution, which basically is meant to replace plasma. We've got perfluorocarbon emulsions. These carry dissolved oxygen. They're not as good as normal hemoglobin because they're not as effective and they don't last as long, but they have, they're a short-term solution. And also we have these hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers. They're meant to replace hemoglobin, but again, they're not as effective because they're not encased in a normal red blood cell. In the future, we're going to be working on, we're still working on artificial hemoglobin, which we're trying to make out of stem cells. And this basically allows us to make normal red blood cells with normal hemoglobin inside of it, which will be much more effective as the ones we have at the moment. That's the progress, and then you need to propose, which means put reasons, for reasons why such research is needed. So why are we actually developing artificial blood? So why we need it is, first of all, we need to have a shortage of supply. So by making artificial blood, we have more supply. Also, because artificial blood is sterile, we have less problems with infecting other people with uh, infected blood, because it's less contam contamination when it comes to artificial blood. Also, we've got less complications, because we have no blood types that we have normal blood, so there's less complications with matching certain blood types. And also can be stored for long periods of time. And that's good because normal blood might only last for weeks, months, sometimes months, whereas artificial blood can last for, and storage-wise, it can last for years. So it's, these were some of the reasons why we need to have artificial blood. First one covers this one, which says outline, which means sketch in general terms, the need for oxygen living cells. We need oxygen to make ATP in the form of cell respiration. Cell respiration is when we have glucose and oxygen coming together to form ATP. And that's good because we need to have that energy to be able to reproduce move, repair, and grow. So without the actual um, oxygen, we wouldn't be able to do that and we wouldn't be able to survive. That's why we need oxygen living cells. And the next one was explain, which means show the adaptive advantage of hemoglobin. We need hemoglobin because most of our oxygen is actually carried in blood. So about 98% sorry, is carried in hemoglobin. So without hemoglobin, we would have less oxygen. And with hemoglobin, we have more oxygen, which means we can make more energy. And that's really important for multicellular organisms, such as humans and birds, because they need to be able to sustain lots of cells, and for that they need to have lots of oxygen. So without hemoglobin, they wouldn't be able to survive more or less, and they wouldn't have it adapted or evolved into those organisms. Next one was explain, which means show why. Removal of carbon dioxide from cells is essential. 
In this case, what happens here is we have carbon dioxide that reacts with water in cells that forms um, carbonic acid, which then dissociates to form hydrogen ions, and that's what lowers the pH. So carbon dioxide reacts with water to lower pH. The problem is when the pH is lowered, that will denature enzymes in cells. That means those and those cells don't work as well because the enzymes don't aren't there to speed up their chemical reactions. That's why we need to remove carbon dioxide from cells to make sure enzymes work properly. And next one was demonstrate, which means show the effect of dissolved carbon dioxide on the pH of water. So in this case, we've got two samples. We've got two beakers, one control, and the other one is where we're going to have our lime water and we're going to bubble into it. So we're going to have both of them have lime water, but one of them we're going to bubble into with a straw. When we bubble into it, we add carbon dioxide, and that's obvious because lime water will change color to a whitish color, which means we have the presence of carbon dioxide. And if you check that with a pH meter, you'll find that the pH of that actual bubbled one in will be quite low because water has combined with carbon dioxide to lower the pH. That's just an experiment you did to make sure you can see the effect of carbon dioxide on water, the one we discussed in a second ago. Next one is identify, which means name, recognize. The current technologies allow measurement of oxygen saturation and carbon dioxide concentration in blood. So the one that is used to measure oxygen concentration is a pulse oximeter, so you need to know that one. And the one that is measured oxygen saturation and carbon dioxide concentration is the arterial blood gas analysis. So you need to know that one as well. But the next dot points, or the next part of that dot point says describe and explain, which means provide features and characteristics and relate the conditions under which these technologies are used to why they're being used. So we need to describe the settings they're being used. For example, the pulse oximeter is generally used in hospital settings, but more or less the monitoring, so non-emergency settings because oxygen saturation gives us a good early warning sign. If there's, a, if there's a problem, if this oxygen saturation levels drop too low, that's a good warning for the actual nurses. But it doesn't give us enough detail for emergencies, which is why the arterial blood gas analysis gives us more detail, oxygen concentration, blood pH, and carbon dioxide concentration. So that's used in emergencies. They'll get a sample of your blood. If, for example, the oxygen saturation has dropped too low, they'll get a sample to get some more detailed information. And that's why the arterial blood gas analysis is generally used in emergencies, whereas pulse oximeters is used in non-emergency hospital settings, but more monitoring as opposed to critical situations. Well, the first, I cover the first top point, which says identify, which means name or recognize the forms in which each of the following is carried in mammalian blood, carbon dioxide, oxygen, water, salts, lipids, nitrogen, waste, and other products of digestion. So basically you need to know the substance and the forms that are carried in blood. So for example, oxygen is carried as dissolved plasma Dissolved in plasma or oxyhemoglobin, so two forms, need to both those. Carbon dioxide can be dissolved in plasma, travel as carbon mini hemoglobins or as hydrogen carbon ions, need to know all three of those forms. Nitrogen waste can travel as urea, water travels as water molecules, lipids travels in water as chylomicrons, that's in the protein, glucose and amino acids travel dissolved in plasma, and salts travel as ions. That was the first top point. The other one is that I cover now, it's described, which means provide characteristics and features of the main changes in the chemical composition of the blood as it moves around the body, and also identify, which means name recognize, the tissue in which these changes occur. So you need to know when any all of these substances leave or enter the blood. So for example, if you've got oxygen, it will actually go into the blood at the lungs, so it will go into the blood at the lungs, but it will leave the blood at all other tissues, because those cells need to have that oxygen. And we have carbon dioxide, that will actually enter the blood at all the different tissues because of a byproduct of cell respiration, so they go inside to the actual blood at those tissues, but it will leave the actual blood at the lungs, so it's going to leave the blood at the lungs. And we have nitrogenous waste, it's going to be entering the blood at the liver, so it enters the blood at the liver, and it will leave the actual blood at the kidneys. We have water molecules, they just um, come into the blood at the digestive tract, and they leave at all other parts. Lipids, they enter at the digestive tract as well, and they leave at the liver. We have glucose amino acids, they enter also the digestive tract and leave the liver. And glucose also leaves any other part of the body for cell respiration. And salts will actually enter also at the digestive tract and leave at any part of the tissue, any tissue. So this is what you need to know. You need to know the substance and where it moves in and where it moves out of the blood. You need to be able to describe that. The next one I'll cover is this one, compare, which means show how the structure of arteries, capillaries, and veins are different or similar in relation to their function. So we need to compare structure and function and we need to compare all three of those. So the artery is everything that moves things away from the heart. It's close to the heart, which means it's going to have the highest pressure because the heart will, the, the heart will pump into the arteries. That's why it has a very thick muscular wall to be able to withstand that pressure. Also, it needs to be able to change the size of its lumen, so that the size of the lumen, lumen is the inner side. 
And the reason why it needs to be able to change that is because if the heart is relaxed, it needs to be small. If it's actually pumping, it needs to be big to keep that same blood pressure, which means that it needs to be able to constant change. That's why it has that thick elastic layer, which is like rubber, to be able to change size. And its lumen is going to be smaller than that of the actual um, of the actual veins because it needs to be keeping a certain blood pressure. So the lumen needs to be smaller. Whereas with the veins, it has a different type of function because the veins, they transport blood back to the heart. The walls are going to be thinner than the arteries because they have to withstand less blood pressure. And also we're going to have the elastic layer being thinner because they don't have to change size. They are not um, exposed to the actual heart pumping. So they need to have the same size. They don't, they don't need to change size, which means the elastic layer is going to be the same at all times. But because they have low blood pressure, because the blood travels at a lower pace, they need to be able to transport more, which is why they have a bigger lumen than those of arteries. The last one we need to cover are the capillaries. The capillaries are the ones that move the actual blood towards the cells. They can make sure we have nutrients get cells, and uh, nutrients are moved into cells. And what they have is they have a very, very small lumen, so only five micrometers as opposed to millimeters and big. And that's to make sure that the actual blood slows down before it gets to the cells because that allows it to have more time for diffusion to occur. And also, the actual capillaries have a very thin membrane. They don't have any cell walls at all. All they have is a very thin membrane. This membrane allows diffusion to occur, and that's important because the cells need to be able to get those nutrients from the actual capillaries. I'll cover this document first. It says, describe. Describe means provide characteristics and features of current theories about the responsible process responsible for the movement of materials through plants and xylem and phloem. So the actual theory of how things move through xylem it's called transpiration pull, and all of this is to do with passive transport, it doesn't require energy. So xylem transports water and ions, and this happens because water enters the roots through osmosis, so that's how it gets into roots, osmosis. And then it basically it, make, it doesn't drop back down once it gets into the stem because of cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is when water molecules are attached to each other, and adhesion is when water molecules are attached to the wall of the xylem. So this basically makes sure that water doesn't drop down against gravity, that's good. But we also need to have something happening at the leaves. So at the leaves, we have transpiration, which is basically evaporation of water. So some of these actual water molecules will leave at the leaves. But what happens now is because of cohesion, we have all these water molecules being connected to each other. So if some, some leave, the other ones are being pulled up. And that basically makes sure that water moves from the bottom to the top, from the roots to the actual leaves. And all the whole thing is called transpiration pull. So it pulls water against gravity without using energy. And the other one was phloem. So phloem transports glucose. The, pro the theory is called translocation or source to sink. And it, all of this requires energy, so it's active transport. So what happens first is at the source, which is where the actual glucose is being produced, that's at the leaf, glucose is being pumped from the leaf, so from the source, into the phloem tube. And it's done through active transport, so it requires energy. And when, it, when the actual glucose enters the phloem tube, which is this part here, it, what, what will happen is you're going to have water that comes from the nearby xylem tube and it will move into the actual phloem tube because glucose is solute, so water will go from a low solute concentration area, which is the xylem tube, to a high concentration area, which is the actual phloem tube. And that means we're going to have much more water and much more gl glucose in that area just next to the source, which means we're going to have a pressure buildup next to the area because of a high amount of, of glucose and water. And this will make sure the actual glucose travels from an area of high pressure, which is the source, to an area of low pressure, which is a sink, because things just always and travel from high pressure to low pressure. And this pressure buildup will just yeah, will make the actual glucose move from source to sink. But once it gets to source, as, sorry, once it gets to sink, which is, for example, where sink is where the actual glucose will be needed. So it might be a, a um, stem cell or a root cell. This is where glucose will be actively pumped into that cell. And once glucose leaves, so once the solute leaves, there's less solute now in the, in the actual phloem tube, so water will travel back into the xylem tube through osmosis, right? But that's just the idea of source to sink. That's how phloem moves from the place where it's produced, the source, to where it's needed, which is the stem or the actual root, and it does so through translocation. So you need to know those, both those processes, and also the names, and, and one is active, the other one is passive. And you also need to be able to draw a transverse and longitudinal section of phloem and xylem tissue. This is just a transverse section of the actual stem. And you can see xylem is the one in the inside of that stem, and phloem is the one on the outside. And you also should draw the longitudinal sections. This is, for example, longitudinal section of xylem. This one is the longitudinal section of phloem, this part here. 
And you should also be able to know, for example, that this this part here is, a, is the um, sieve tube. This here is the sieve plate. And this part here is the companion cell. So this is what you need to know in terms of drawing. You need to be able to draw a label. So you need to know the structures and how it looks as well. But this was just a quick summary of the last 12 dot points of the second context point for this module.